just publish my own book? Why didn't I take this and make it a physical copy for people to read? I'm Ethan Randallis, I'm 18, I'm running for governor of Kansas. Aaron Coleman, I was the second teenager to announce my run. They contributed to the American, you know, society and, you know, created children and grandchildren that are now prosperous and contributing to, to our community. school you learn about MLK you learn how he ended racism how he was a peaceful man and it wasn't until like over this last summer I picked up one of uh, a book called Radical King which is a collection of MLK speeches and reading MLK and remember memorizing his speeches you realize how such a knowledgeable important man he was and how he really was about change and love so MLK helped me to understand what love is and what nonviolence direct action is and how it can work effectively. Because it has worked effectively for him. He got this Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act. And today's march is an example of MLK's nonviolence direct action strategy. We are here creating tension in the nation's capital. We are here creating a conflict. We're creating a disturbance in the nation. We are here to raise awareness because we don't have to be violent. We all we have to do is raise our voices up and appeal to the morality of this nation and we can make change and MLK helped me realize that and that's why I'm here. My favorite Martin Luther King Jr. quote is very short. Unjust laws should not be obeyed. That's my favorite Dr. King quote. In other words, Dr. King has said you have to pay the price if you break the law. That's the social contract that allows us to have society is the law. But if it's an unjust law, you shouldn't obey that law, although you must be prepared to pay the price. We also attended the Women's March and we were talking about earlier today how there hasn't been a lot of marches in our lifetime that were as big as the Women's March and as this mar the March for Our Lives and this kind of is incredibly comparable to the MLK March and his I Have a Dream speech and that's what I kind of think of like just being at the reflecting pool and seeing all these people you definitely feel the same spirit that the people felt back then. A characteristic of MLK that really impacted me more than anything else was his fearlessness. Being able to go travel the country and give, give these marches and give these speeches, knowing the consequences that would come towards him or his family has motivated me and given me that type of fearlessness. Now, whenever I do things, I know I have nothing, to, I really have nothing to lose, right? So I give it my 100% and I try to imitate that type, that, that same type of energy that MLK had back then.
I'm Jack Ferguson, and I'm running to be the Democratic nominee for the for governor of Kansas. I decided to run when I first heard that uh, Jack Ferguson is running. Tyler Ruzik, I'm a Republican uh, running for governor of the state of Kansas. I'm Ethan Randallis, I'm 18, I'm running for governor of Kansas. Aaron Coleman, I was the second teenager to announce my run. I sat on it for a while and then finally decided to do it in October. I googled uh, how to run for Kansas governor. You know, double check to make sure in the state constitution that there was an age requirement. And when there wasn't, I was, you know, just really completely surprised, caught off guard. When you're our age, you need to have something other than just being a platform person. And to me, that's just tackling the biggest issues that I think face our state, which are transparency and education. I would, day one, pretty much tell Kansas Legislature, you either have a choice to act or be acted upon. Yeah, I want to leave you alone. I want to take over the government and leave you alone. But I think really the biggest hurdle I've had to overcome is that people are viewing that people, although less so than when I first announced, people are viewing this as a, as a gag or something, something like that. He's just really been earnest about it and dead serious. This is, wasn't um, something that he took lightly or any of that. Um, my reaction was, go for it, it's awesome. He wanted to do it and I, I've been pretty proud of him. I thought it was silly, nobody gonna elect a teenager. I think I'll have a really good chance at 5%. <laughs> I, that's the goal of 5%. It's, it's not a crazy goal, but it makes it major, it's major party status. And I think that's the, that's the next goal, is get major party status for the Libertarians. Winning this election, I'm gonna try 100% to win this, but winning this election even, isn't even necessarily being elected. It's just getting a younger generation and just everyone able to understand and become more politically involved and influenced. <laughs> In the next 10 to 20 years, we'll be the majority of the voting population. We have to get engaged now to start running for office, to start campaigning for candidates. You need to have voters, especially between the ages of 18 and 25, active in voting because Generation Z and the Millennials are going to be political powerhouses in the coming elections. I've learned this from Ms. Reese and Ms. Mindy to always just stay the same and stay humble because these are powerful powerhouse women in this industry. for my character was that I used to read a lot of books and most of the characters would be male, the, ma the main character. They were, there would be uh, female characters, but they would be sidekicks, like really intelligent female characters, but they would always be sidekicks. I wanted to write about someone I could look up to. Um, and that's where I came up with the idea for this main character. She's a warrior, a general. She can do anything she wants. You know, she's powerful. And that was just me looking up to somebody, wanting to write about a role model for it. Yeah, for me and other girls. Mariam was always into books. And I remember when she was uh, three years old, um, I noticed that whenever she would be upset, uh, the, you know, the only thing that would raise her spirits was to... Uh, you know, read her, read her a story. And I could tell from her expressions that, um, you know, she would be lost in her own, you know, imaginary world. And, um, you know, when she was in kindergarten, I gave her a journal with pen and, and um, I asked her to write in it and, you know, to express her feelings. And I think her writing journey, you know, began from there. So I started writing on this website. Uh, it's called Wattpad. And um, a lot of my friends used to write on there just for fun. They'd like make up their own short stories. It's a website mainly um, 
there for you to write your own stories on or novels. And mine started getting a lot of attention. I got over half a million reads, and I'm still getting more reads to this day. Um, so from there, somebody told me, they were like, I want to rewrite your whole book, and I want to give it to a loved one. And I was like, really? People like it that much? Like, it was surprising to me, but then I was like, why don't I just publish my own book? Why don't I take this and make it a physical copy for people to read, to, like, you know, sell? Um, and I, a lot of my followers, they... I bought the books after because they were such big fans. And then they asked for a second book, and that's how the story went on. We were all very excited. And uh, I remember that day when the first book came in, we just jumped and we were just dancing around and clapping and doing high fives, you know, and it was, it's very unexplainable. Uh, she had the I think both of them are equally uh, supportive. Um, they always supported me. They never told me I couldn't do something. Uh, she had now I take extra English classes at school just because I enjoy reading and writing. So that's always been my hobby since I was little. like three or four of, of this printing left. Oh, wow. I'm Jewela Wilson, co-creator of Ms. Marvel. So Ms. Marvel began with a phone call I had in 2012 with Asana Amanat and Steve Wacker, who were two editors at Marvel Comics. And they pitched me this very simple idea. They said they wanted to create a new American Muslim superheroine for a young adult audience, and they were going to give her her own ongoing monthly comic book series. To the nerds. And they asked me if I wanted to develop the character and write the series. So of course I said yes. <laughs> All the places that Kumal has been, we get to see that. It's pretty awesome. You know, that they base a superhero off our school. Yeah, and I think that the comic book represents the diversity that we have in our school. I wanted her to have powers that looked unique that were interesting to look at on the page, uh, that were not superpowers that we often associate with uh, girls, so nothing sparkly. <laughs> I didn't want her to be a telepath to read people's minds. I wanted her to have very active powers, very physical powers, and that were not necessarily something pretty uh, or girly. I wanted them to be interesting. She faces the, a lot of the same challenges that any teenager faces about family, school, peer pressure, uh, what she wants to do with her life. She's only not dealing with um, the school side of things, like the culture clashes, like her parents want, are trying to be traditional, and I guess that's a bit cliche, but she's really struggling with it because she wants to maintain her Muslim identity. Growing up religious, I always, like, I would debate. There's a scene where Kamala goes to the mosque and she's talking about the responsibility you have towards people, sort of vaguely implying she might be a superhero, but she doesn't want to tell the imam that she's this. And I would have those hypothetical conversations with rabbis in my head. Could I be allowed on the Sabbath to, to yeah. break Sabbath laws, to use my superpower? Like, these are things that I thought of. So Ms. Marvel connected with me immensely. Some people in the American Muslim community said that they wouldn't read the book because she does not wear hijab. And then other people said, no, she's too religious, you know, she should be more secular, you know. So, it, you know, be, because there was only one, everybody wanted it to reflect their own experience, which is impossible. The point of a superhero is to be a symbol for the culture at that time. And, and you can't control how that plays out. And uh, so I'm not possessive, you know, it's, it's, she belongs to the readers, not to me. Imagine 91 billion light years traveled like that. Sweet dreams are made of this. The movie um, is about a little girl, Meg, whose father has been lost. And um, she's going through a lot of self doubt in her life. And these three spirits come into her life um, Mrs. Who, Mrs. What's It, Mrs. Witch, and they are her guides through the universe where her father is stuck. And they take her to these multiple planets, lands out there in the universe, 
And in the process of discovering her father, she develops courage and she learns to take risks and she learns what really matters and what doesn't. He's trapped by a darkness that's actively spreading throughout the universe. And the only one who can stop it is you. Be a warrior. I'll try. People that are gonna watch this movie are gonna learn some lessons. And like all walks of life, no matter if you're 80 years old or you're 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, it doesn't matter. You're gonna walk out and you're gonna be like, yes, I can conquer the world, yes, I'm gonna go save the universe now. You're going to be tested every step of the way. Trust nothing. Darling, time for dinner. I think about how few times we get to see young women at the center of big Hollywood movies, but also women of color. And that little girls out there will know that, you know, they, they see themselves on screen in this real way with this wonderful girl, um, that anything is possible. You can overcome anything in your life if you have the right mental attitude and the right kind of work ethic, and I think that's what Storm embodies in this story. And out of all the things a father in 1959 could have told his gay son, my father tells me to be proud of myself and not sneak. I'm riding to school with my oldest brother, and on the way to school, I'm putting glitter all over my face. And my brother said, what in the hell are you doing? I said, I'm putting on my costume. He said, well, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing that. So he dropped me off at the school, and he called my dad up, and he said, Dad, I think you better get up there. This is not going to look good. So my dad drove up to the high school. And he had his farmer jeans on, and they had cow crap on him, and he had his clodhopper boots on. And when I saw him coming, I ducked around the hall and hid from him. And it wasn't because of what I was wearing. <laughs> it was because of what he was wearing. So the assembly goes well, and I climb in the car, and I'm riding home with my father. And my father says to me, uh, I was walking down the hall this morning and I saw a kid that looked a lot like you ducking around the hall to avoid his dad, but I know it wasn't you because you would never do that to your dad. And I squirmed in my seat and I finally busted out and I said, well, Dad, did you have to wear your cow crap jeans to my <laughs> assembly? And he said, look, everybody knows I'm a dairy farmer. This is who I am. And he looked me square in the eye. And then he said, now how about you when you're a full-grown man? Who are you going to go out with at night? And I said, I don't know. And he said, I think you do know. And it's not going to be that McLaughlin girl that's been making goo-goo eyes at you, but you won't even pick up the damn telephone. And I'm going to tell you something today, and you might not know what to think of it now, but you're going to remember when you're an adult, don't sneak. Because if you sneak like you did today, it means you think you're doing the wrong thing. And if you run around and spend in your whole life thinking that you're doing the wrong thing, then you'll ruin your immortal soul. And out of all the things a father in 1959 could have told his gay son, my father tells me to be proud of myself and not sneak. My reaction at the time was to get out in the hayfield and pretend like I was as much of a man as I could be. And I remember flipping 50-pound bales three feet up into the air going, I'm not a queer. What's he talking about? <laughs> but he knew where I was headed. And he, he knew that making me feel bad about it in any way was the wrong thing to do. I had the patron saint of dads for sissies and no I didn't know it at the time but I know it now
the little girl in what appears to be a confirmation dress, uh -huh. white confirmation dress, is me. I remember that dress particularly because it was a beautiful organza dress and it, it had these little pleats in the front of it. Um, and, you know, the little white gloves, I mean, my grandmother standing right next to me, it was just, it evokes such memories. I'm a director of the Mayor's Mural Crew. What I wanted to capture is the generations that we have and how similar the stories of each generation is. The central figure is the more iconic uh, grandmother wearing an apron and rolling out the dough. I noticed in looking over a lot of reference photos that the posture of making tortillas and making pasta is exactly the same. People here are really linked to where they came from, even if it was generations ago. And we want to connect that pride and that love for today's immigrants as well. Me hace sentirme, como te dijera, identificada. Me identifico con, con esas abuelas que vinieron sin nada también, que vinieron con un sueño. People in Boston still refer to their neighborhoods by the parish church that is closest. One of the questions that the um, Italian grandmothers asked the Central American grandmothers, where do you go to church? <laughs> That's what life's about, all these stories, all these people here. They contributed to the American, you know, society and, you know, created children and grandchildren that are now prosperous and contributing to, to our community. A lot of elderly people now are around and you don't see many, many young kids, they're just, they're all gone. I used to come in here and when I was a young boy, my parents used to bring me in here to get my hair cut. And uh, when you walk in the door, there'd be 10, 13 people sitting in the chair, all talking about businesses that happened during the day and waiting in line to get a haircut.